intelligence. Uh, in uh, in your city long term, we, we have different type of projects in artificial intelligence. So uh, I will talk a little bit about, about uh, different ones, but I will focus on the visual part. It's more interesting. You will see videos, you will see images. So it talks more than just some text. So I'll start right away with what the type of projects we are doing right now in the University of Malta. So we have research projects and applied projects that we do with the different companies. Uh, here in the province, but we have companies in Ontario, Newfoundland, and Labrador, different provinces working with us. So in machine learning, for example, we are working uh, mainly in deep learning, uh, big data analytics, natural language processing, and uh, now we are starting working uh, in developing AI at the edge, so we, we work in optimizing the algorithms to make them work in embedded systems and in mobile uh, and smartphone. Uh, computer vision, we have different type of projects. I, I will show some examples in medical imaging, uh, biometrics, and we are also working in machine vision and industrial vision. Because my background, my past background, I was working in Quebec, was in transfer technology related to industrial vision and industrial robotics. Uh, and of course, we are work working also in robotics, so we are interested with the unmanned autonomous systems like uh, UAVs, drones, for example, and UGVs. You would see some of the, the things that we have developed in the past autonomous navigation and industrial robotics. So, the applications area are many, so we are working in the healthcare. We have some projects in medical imaging. We are starting one project with the, the Institute, the Atlantic Cancer Research Institute, in using genomics and proteomics to detect some type of cancer. And we have some uh, projects in manufacturing, in insurance, uh, especially FinTech. There is different type of project like pro in project management, in finance, in insurance. I will not talk a lot about this part because we have some companies uh, and we have some conf confidentiality related to this type of project. So I'll skip those, but uh, it's mainly related to uh, predictive analytics and NLP. We have some projects uh, in telecommunications, sports, and, uh, all, and one big part is in defense and security. So I would start with the security and defense. We have different projects, so I selected some to, to show you the type of things that we have developed in, uh, in the past. So you can see here one example of uh, related to wildland fires. So uh, th this is a project uh, I was doing with the, uh, the University of Corsica in France, a collaboration with them because there is a lot of fires in the south of France. So we have developed a system capable of tracking fires in real time and building an approximate shape of the fire. So we can compute some parameters like, for example, you see the curves there. Over time, we can compute the height, the width, the, the thickness, the length, the approximate volume and surface. And with these parameters, the weather parameters and the topography, we can predict the, the propagation of the fire. So there is different models based on different vegetation, of course, because the models in France will we not work in Canada. We have different models. And the idea here is when you have this information, you can predict where the fire will be in one hour, in two hours, for example, and you can send your firefighters to block the advance of the fires instead of running after the fire, which is the case now, and it's not efficient. And we, to do that, to get the, the parameters to build the 3D model, because as you, as you have seen here, this is the approximation of the fire that we, have, that we are capturing. We, of course, I, I forget to mention that we have built a system that uses visual uh, images and uh, near-infrared, because near-infrared uh, pass through the smoke, so when there is smoke, we are able to get the shape of the fire. And to get the, the shape using multiple cameras, we are working in stereo camera to build the 3D model, we have to segment the fire. So we have to find the area where the fire is, and we are uh, interested in wildland fire. So the, the, the envi environment we are working in is uh, unstructured and controlled. So we are outside, uh, the, the lighting can change, the weather can change. So uh, in different, we can work in different countries. So we, you have some images there of the fire 
GT is the ground truth. This is the, the ground truth that was labeled by a human. And we have developed the deep learning techniques that segment the, the image to get just the part where the fire is. And we have some high score uh, with the, in this kind of context where the fires uh, have, uh, uh, are taken in different conditions. We have an F1 score for of 91 percent, which means that the overlap that we have between between the ground truth and what we get as a segmentation, we have 91 percent overlap. So we have very good result in this kind of segmentations, and an accuracy of 97 percent. These models are built using um, architectures like UNET for those familiar with the UNET architectures, and we have modified this kind of architectures to make them efficient for the kind of applications that we have here. You can see other type of images. The nice thing is to, you can see, <coughs> even if you have smoke, etc., we are interested just on the fire part, because that's the most in, in important part to predict the propagation of the fire with the models that we have. And you can see that the ground truth and the technique we have developed, they are very, very close. Of course, we are interested on, on using that for in uh, context in aerial images because if, if you want to cover a large area because the fire, uh, in wildland fire and forest fires cover a large area. So we, would, we have started working with the UAVs and the idea is to detect the fire. You see here the aerial image, we detect the fire and we segment the area of the fire and we will use this information to build the 3D model and predict the propagation of the fire over time. Other applications are related to security of large perimeters. In this case here we are uh, interested in uh, detecting faces uh, at a distance. So for example if you want to secure an airport or uh, a sensitive site, for example, and you have a lot of cameras, you, you cannot have always some cameras that can zoom to a specific person, for example, for face recognition. So the idea here is to use super resolution and to uh, somehow uh, zoom in the face, but keeping the structure of the face so we can recognize the face. And you will see some of the examples that we have developed here. We, we are working in near infrared, with near infrared images. So you can see the tiny image. If we zoom on the image, this is the kind of, of face that we, we have. So with this kind of face, you can look at the person. So what we have developed uh, an architecture, a deep learning architect architecture based on, on GANs, on generative adversarial, adversarial networks, that is able to get this image from the initial one. So we, we somehow zoom on the image and get the structure. So we are able to recognize, and here, you can see the ground truth. So the images looks like the ones that we have uh, created. Classical techniques, in general, smooth the image so we are not able to get the structure it's, and it's difficult to recognize the faces. Similar result with long wave infrared. With long wave infrared, uh, these cameras are thermal cameras so we are capturing the, the, the temperature of the person and they are very useful, for example, when you don't have the light, for example, so you can capture the temperature even if uh, in the night, for example. So you can see here the, the and last I think, again, it's, it's how uh, the technique that we have developed and the ground truth. The last one is the ground truth. So they look similar. And for example, if you, you can see in the last one that we can recognize the person, for example. So we, if we build the face recognition, we can, from teeny images, recognize the person and take action for them. So what we did is we built the recognition part. And uh, to make it uh, robust, we inserted the classifier. This is the, the part, the last one is the part that where face recognition happens. But to make sure that it works best, what we did is we inputted the result of the classification within the one that is creating the, the super resolved image. So during training, because in deep learning, it's re, uh, deep learning is related to deep neural networks, we have images and we train our model to do something, to classify, to segment, to do whatever we want it to do. And by inputting the result of the classifier, we increase the, the performance of our recognition. 
can see here, for example, in the visible spectrum, we have the low resolution image. We have the result we obtained with our approach, which is 60 times the, the, the size of the original image is 40x, 4x by 4x, four times in x and four times in, uh, in y. And you, you, here you have the ground truth. So, of course, you, you see there is some similarity between the images. And when we did face recognition, top one accuracy was close to 99%. Here we have a data set with 72 individuals, which is interesting to, to get as, as a result and if, if you want to secure a large area, for example, and you have uh, the, some people that work for you, for example, in your data set, so you can, you can recognize the, these people and recognize that someone has nothing to do to be there and take action for them. So, uh, of course, we, uh, we used similar approaches, but this time for depicting some small objects. You can see here an aerial, aerial image. Uh, it's tiny image, so if you, we scale the image, you, you have this kind uh, of, uh, of picture. So it's difficult to see uh, the object there. This is the ground truth, and I point here, the, the resolution is not that, that good for, for the projector, but you can see here uh, a vehicle it's difficult to see here because when we just zoom the image, that some information disappears and we are not able to detect this kind of object. So we can look closer. We see the you see the vehicle there. So it's the point of interest in what that we want to demonstrate the the, uh, the robustness of our algorithm. Here. So you can see. There, the ground truth, we have the vehicle, the classical technique, it's difficult sitting. And you have the ground truth, you see there is a vehicle there in the parking with classical technique, it's smooth, so we, we don't see almost nothing. And with the, our technique, which is uh, increased or super resolved at 64 times, we are able to detect this kind of object. Here, it's about vehicles, so we, if we zoom, you can see the ground truth and our technique, we are able to detect this kind of object. And I think even if someone is swimming in the pool, we can detect the, the person. There's nobody there, but, but it's we are able to do this kind of detections. Another type of, uh, of projects are related to UAVs. So we, we started working UAVs for Navi, for example, for the navigation in GPS denied environment. Uh, if you have heard about uh, the maneuvers between uh, uh, in the north, uh, it was in the North Sea be between the US and uh, Norway, I think, and Russia has blocked the GPS. Uh, in, it was last year, I think. So the idea here, even if you lose your GPS, the, the UAV are able to find his way to a safer area. So we simulate that we, we don't have the GPS, of course, we, we have it. It's our ground truth, we can compare our precision with the, what we have. And we uh, use computer vision, so vision techniques to find some important features that tell us where to go next. So the idea here, there is two possibilities. If you navigate, for example, from one point to another point, you can take some picture, it's like the breadcrumbs that, that you take in your, in your route. And uh, of course, you cannot keep all these images because the, the, the storage will be limited in the UAV. So what we do is we extract some features and we keep a vector of 128 elements uh, only. And it's sufficient to find where we are in, in time and we, go, we can go back to our uh, initial position. Or you can use a map. If you have a map, so you can extract these features and find your way back also. So I will activate this one. You see, for example, the first uh, curve shows the simulation of UAV. The, this image here shows a real scenario because we took, we took some images near Kokan area, close here to Moncton, so to test it in a real life scenario. And you see these lines here are the features that we are comparing from, one, from uh, our route from point A to point B and when we are back to find our our way to the to our initial position. Here we are zooming, you will see a lot of particles. What we are doing is we are predicting over time where to look next. 
This way we reduce the amount of vectors we have to match and we can keep this running in real time because we will need to go back very fast to a safer zone in certain situations. So you can see, yeah, it worked. So you see, for example, the images, this is the real life images near Coca, and we predict where to look next so the, we can reduce the amount of images that we compare. And this helps speed up the, the process. We have other projects in UAV tracking. In this case, it can be uh, competitive or, co or cooperative. For example, if, if you want to fly information or have a collaboration between different UAVs, you will need somehow to see where the leader is and follow the leader. But you can, for example, uh, track a UAV. You can get target, lock on the target, and follow the target to do something. And you imagine what we can do then. <laughs> so the idea here is really to for security applications. So the idea is to use uh, a follower or a tracker that detects the leader or the target, because depending it's in pursuit or it's in cooperation. And we are using uh, deep learning to track this object. And uh, with the, the information that we have, where the location of the UAV is, we are able to control the, the flight of the UAV. We don't work in the low level controls. Uh, I'm not interested on that. I work at the high level. And uh, I, uh, the, since the UAV has its own controls, we just control the motion to make to maneuver and to make it as smooth as possible. But we don't work within the low level controls. So I would show two approaches. The first one is based on deep reinforcement learning. And for those, I don't, uh, how many people are familiar with reinforcement learning here? A couple of persons. So reinforcement learning is a very, very interesting, interesting uh, idea. So the idea here is you train your, uh, your algorithm to do something. And every time he gets a good result, you give him a reward. And every time he has a bad reward, you give him a penalty. Okay? So it's plus and minus. And over time, he will learn to be as good as possible. It's like, like humans. I mean, like, as, if, uh, less you, as, as, le, as less penalized as possible. As less penalized as possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the idea here is really, the, the, and, and we have, of course, to, to be careful with, with what we do. It's not just uh, straight mathematics. You have to be imaginative. For example, I have an, a student working on autonomous uh, driving. And, uh, and he's uh, interested in, uh, in uh, uh, racing, N not just driving in a city, but uh, race, uh, uh, I mean, car racing. And uh, he uh, uh, put a lot of penalty on uh, when the vehicle goes outside the, the route, okay, the, the, the road. So uh, um, over time, the, the, the vehicle learned to not to move. <laughs> so he stayed there. <laughs> so this way, he, he, he don't have rewards, but he don't have penalties. <laughs> so in this kind of approaches, you have to be really careful and imaginative and find a way to train it, be a, a compromise in rewards uh, and penalties, and uh, this way he, he can converge on time. Yeah, I will show you here, using this kind of techniques, to predict the actions to send to the UAV so he can move in one or another direction. We uh, adapted the ADNet, the Action uh, Detection Network, which is a, a deep neural network. And this network is based on uh, VGG. And for some reason, oh, OK. That's the, the upside down. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, okay, so the action predicted are these ones. So uh, the, the UAV will predict if he has to go left, right, uh, has to be fa uh, with, with the higher speed to the left or high speed to the, to the right, up or down. And we have added this one uh, compared to what a, a classical ADN would do. We have the aspect ratio because when the UAV is moving, sometimes it's not, it's not always, you are not aligned perfectly behind the UAV. So there is some uh, maneuverability and you, you can have this aspect ratio and you have to 
to uh, take it into account. So here we can see a video. So this is the kind of actions that were predicted in order to move the UAV, and they will show you a video showing this working in the campus. We have tested it in the campus of Minister Moncton. And you can see here, we keep track with the UAV. And it, it works in real time. You will see it's 26 something kilometers per second, but this is just to show you the actions that are predicted uh, and sent the, to the, the, the tracker to track this kind of, uh, of UAV. It will just accelerate somehow, otherwise it's, it can be boring to, to see the same thing. <laughs> I think this is maybe the last one. So he predict all these actions and he sent them and the, the, the follower UEV has will move somehow based on all these vector of actions that he have received. So of course he was trained to, to make some uh, some as, as smooth as possible, but it's not always. Easy. So you can see we are really, all, we keep track of the UAV. The, the green is the UAV and the red is what we have detected and we have predicted. So this is, that shows how, uh, that the, this technique is working. However, however, we needed to improve the speed of this technique. So we developed a new approach based on similar thing. We have a deep learning for object detection but now we, we are using prediction. This is a hybrid algorithm that uses some, tech, uh, some classical techniques from computer vision called partic particle filters. So we put with particle filters, what we do is, if we have a history of detection, I can predict the next time where the, the UAV will be. So before, before the next image, I can have an idea where to look. So th this helps speed up the, the processing and have some interesting results uh, in terms of, uh, of robustness. So we can see here a video. This was done also in the campus of NFC Mountain. So you can see the tracking. Uh, the first one is uh, maneuvered by human, and uh, the, the one that is tracking is automatically tracking this UAV. And you see he keeps track of it almost all the time. You don't lose it. And the most interesting thing about it is that we, what we compute is what you call uh, intersection over union, which is somehow the overlap of what we have detected and the real tank, okay? That was, uh, because we, we take these images and we label them by human to, to compare to have some metric. And um, we, with the technique that we have proposed, with, with the prediction, we are able to improve the accuracy and we, ca we get this overlap uh, close to eight, between 80 and 90% uh, instead of 70% without, without prediction because we can do it without prediction also. However, it's less robust and uh, especially for further object because the UV is very small. So the, the deep object detector uh, has a hard time detecting this small object. And of course, uh, we want to enlarge our, uh, our work, not just work in the campus, but something larger like Africa. However, it costs too much to go to Africa. <laughs> so we decided to do it in simulation. So we are using AirSim. Uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with AirSim. It's, uh, this thing has, has been built by Microsoft. It's, you can uh, simulate almost everything, uh, UAV navigation, uh, driving in a city, whatever, everything you want, where you have Africa. So sometimes when you, when you track, you have elephants and rhinoceros. We, we don't see them there, but uh, here with high resolution, we can see some of the animals. And we have also some poachers, so we can, we can detect poachers if, <laughs> if you want. Some people has, has used that for detecting po poachers. Uh, so you see here in blue the, the UAV, the tracker, and in red the, the tracked or the target. And with this simulator, we have two types of images. We have the, the, the visible camera images, the color images, and uh, the, the white one is the depth. So we have like a LiDAR, for example on board of this, uh, of this UAV, which is very interesting. For now, we are just working with, with color images, but it would be interesting to work with, uh, with depth, too. So I can show you something here. We are using deep, deep reinforcement learning and improving the algorithm that we have developed before, because I didn't say, I say that, but 
when, you, when the actions are predicted, uh, you can have a different number of actions in the old algorithms. So we developed a new one that predicts a fixed number of, of actions. This helps in speeding up because we were running between 20 and 27 images per second, but because it ch it's changing, the number of actions is, is changing all the time. But if you fix the, that number, you can increase the speed and keep it always at the same frame rate, which is <coughs> something desirable in this kind of, uh, of applications. So I will show you some, we just started this summer, so I don't have a lot to, sh to, to show, but you can see that we track the UEV, so the, the tracker track, try to keep it, keep it within, within the center of the image. That's the objective, to track the, the UEV. The idea is to keep it within the center, and if, depending on what we want to do, we can approach or do something. And uh, we, we train it just to keep, uh, to, to be close, but to keep certain distance, of course. Especially with the, with the real drones. We don't want to lose our drones if there, if there is some, uh, uh, some accidents <laughs> and you will lose your drone. We have started working on, uh, on something. People that were in the, uh, the workshop, I think some people here were in the workshop in the uh, UAB uh, this summer, so we continue working in this type of applications. It's about uh, crowd uh, behavior detection. So uh, there are some companies interested in, in detecting if there is something wrong with the, uh, in, uh, in some crowds. So if you have, we are monitoring a crowd and there is some uh, uh, intensity, something going on somewhere, you will see it in red. There is some action there when there is red. So you can, you can track this kind of, uh, of, of things. We are improving the algorithms that we have de did this, this summer. So this one was, uh, we, we tested it with the, with the, the celebration in Toronto and the, the Toronto Ra Raptors, I think, won the NBA. So you can see here, the, the motion is detected, and you can, you can, for example, see where action, uh, where the action is. Another example here. I don't know if this one is working here, but I had some problems with it. I think it depends on the codec. Yeah, you don't have the codec like uh, one of my codecs. But anyway, uh, this one was just to to. Um, challenged the algorithms because th these algorithms were, were uh, trained on large crowds. Uh, but when you have just people uh, uh, just walking or running, it's difficult. And here, th this one was about, uh, we see Trump uh, going out of his vehicle uh, and uh, we where, where there is uh, people uh, walking, more people, you have some heat. So we, for example, for security people, this can trigger some, something that can be wrong and we can uh, take uh, some measures if, if necessary. Same thing can be adapted to count people. So uh, we can also count people, which is something interesting in some type of application. So you can see here the head of the persons and this gives a count of, of these people. And I will switch to medical imaging. So uh, uh, I talked a lot about uh, security and defense. We, we do a lot of work in this area, but also we are working in medical imaging. One of the, the applications where we have been working uh, last year is uh, diabetic retinopathy. And we have built this, uh, this uh, deep network uh, based on uh, Inception ResNet uh, version 2. Uh, and we have modified, of course, you see the X here because there's some modification to, to the network. There is some uh, different training, like we are using transfer learning with cosine learning rate, DK warm up, and they will not enter into details of that because it's, it's mathematics and uh, I, I didn't put all the, the equations here, just sort of one headaches today <laughs> for people. So uh, the idea here is to build an algorithm that can, for example, if, if you uh, go for to change your glasses, you, they detect the picture of your uh, of the fondus of your eye, and you can detect if you have, uh, you are starting some diabetes, for example, before it's too late. And we, what we did is we collected uh, here we have uh, eight large data sets that are public, that are available. 
the large one is uh, eight packs. Eight packs have something like 35,000 images. So we use that part of that to train our algorithms. And we, uh, after that, we use it for all the different uh, data sets to benchmark uh, our performance. So it was benchmarked on part of the APACs and all other data sets. And you can see here the result of something to do with So you can see here the large one like APACs, Misidor 2 and EOFTA, we have something like close to 98% result. Uh, in uh, Ariander Curve, Ariander Curve is a very interesting measure when we are talking about medical imaging because we don't we don't want false positive and uh, we, we want true positive. Uh, and uh, the sensitivity, for example, tell you when you take a decision that you have diabetic osteopathy, how, how many times you are right. So you can see here the values for the sensitivity and specificity is the inverse. For example, if you say, okay, you don't have the, uh, diabetic retrograde, you don't have diabetes, uh, how, how many times you are right? And the obviously the area and the curve combines the two because we, we we don't want to have one better than the other. We have to take the right decision with when it is uh, related to uh, medical and to health. So uh, you can see that uh, we have very good result, and uh, the only result that is better than that uh, for those who have heard about, uh, about the article of patient research, it's Google. Google DeepMind has. Uh, 99 something results, but they have 45,000 images that we don't have. They are not public, so we cannot benchmark our algorithm to, to theirs. So what we did, we took the, the published the algorithms in the paper, the, the algorithm they, they have used, and we tested it with this data set. And they were in 90, uh, the, re the results were in uh, close to 96%. Of course, we tested it with what we have, and uh, we don't have more images than that. So I think we have something interesting here. Uh, if we can have more images, we can see more and benchmark with what uh, Google has done. The other thing, which is uh, now very important in medical imaging and also in defense, they ask about explainability. Every time, because deep learning was famous for, you have very impressive result, and you don't know why. But it works, so don't ask why. <laughs> but now people are asking, specific, specifically for in some area like medical, uh, the, the medical area, the health area, and the defense. So for what what we did is we uh, uh, developed two algorithms, class activation map and gated back propagation, to see uh, the, the the real performance of, of our algorithm. If, for example, the algorithm decides that there is diabetes uh, in in some of the images, we needed to, to know why. And the interesting thing is these two techniques adapted for this type of images gives very interesting result. You can see, for example, some of the, 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 the things that are related to, um, like for example, if you have hemorrhagic in your eye, you can see it. So we can it work very well for this kind of, of images. So we can use that to explain our result, which is which is good. So you, it's not just we have impressive result, we can explain them, which is very, very interesting in this case. We have worked on another project related to cells nuclei um, uh, segmentation. Uh, this one was published. Uh, and the, the idea here was to automate the nucleus detection. So we, we tested different algorithms. We have adapted three algorithms based on SegNet, UNet, and uh, fully uh, convolutional networks. I won't go into details of those, but the, the best performed one was UNet, adapted specifically for this kind of images. And of course, the paper gives the parameters and the, the way the training was done, etc. So we got uh, an F1 score of 96%. The F1 scores give you the, as I said before, for the the fire images, it gives you the overlap between the ground truth and your result. And you can see here, this is the different type of cells. The idea here, because just um, to go back, this kind of, of segmentation existed before. And uh, in medical imaging and computer vision, we, we used to use texture analysis and color analysis to segment this kind of images. However, uh, for each 
type of image you have a recipe. For example, in this image, you see that there is some color there, so you can use color to, to extract these images. The other one, you, you see some black uh, nucleus, so you can use that. However, the idea here was to, to just uh, use one thing that works whatever the image is. So we have trained our uh, networks to make sure that however the image is, however the color of the image, however the type of these kind of cells, we are able to segment them. And here, the, this row, the, 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 the row in the middle is the ground show, and the last row is our result. And visually, you can see it's about 96 percent, but you can see visually that uh, they are really close. Other project, and I will finish with this tool. So, uh, just to give you, and I selected the visual ones. We are working with kinesiology, the, our department of kinesiology, uh, to use uh, both estimation techniques to uh, do some sport analytics and uh, detect, detect the performance of your athletes, for example, or for rehabilitation, for example, if you have an injury and we want to, to make you. Uh, in, I mean, to, to help you to get the, in good shape, so we have to track your joints, etc. There is some sophisticated systems like Vicon. Vicon uses infrared uh, illumination and infrared sensitive cameras. They cost like three hundred thousand dollars to do the job. They are available, but in this case, we are using a webcam that costs fifty dollars, <laughs> which is kind of completely different scale. <laughs> So the idea is not to replace the Vicon because they are more precise than these ones. However, this will mean that everybody can have this kind of solution. And even we have talked about having your own golf trainer because you, you can track the motion and see if you are good or bad or what to improve over time. The last one, but something that uh, uh, I did the first year in uh, when I came to Northern, uh, it was about um, natural conservancy. The, this data set was released by uh, Natural Conservancy California. We got the, the permission to, to publish with the, our result because the, it wasn't meant to be published uh, uh, when they released it. So um, the idea is to monitor overfishing using onboard camera. Uh, I know that Alaska, for example, have some rules on that. They put some rules, so the, all the boats need to have cameras on board. But the inspectors pass time to check the type of, uh, of fish that's, uh, that was uh, uh, fished and uh, make sure that there is no overfishing. The idea here is to replace this inspector because staying uh, behind your computer counting fish it's not uh, an interesting job, by the way. I will not do the, this kind of job. Anyway. So uh, you can see here it's challenging. Uh, it's very challenging because the, these images here in the boat, uh, you, you see the fish. Sometimes there are occlusions. Sometimes there are more than one fish. And uh, sometimes when uh, the images are taken uh, during the night, so the, the resolution and the quality is not that good. So we have developed the. An algorithm that was trained to get 96% accuracy. Uh, this is top one accuracy, meaning that the first result is correct. And if we see, okay, if we don't have the first one, is it in the second plan place? We have 98.94%, which is a very high result and interesting for this kind of applications. And I think that's all for today. I think uh, so maybe. And over, right? <laughs> Thank you.